Thanks for checking out this interview with me and actress Erin Cummings. Now, this interview is one of the coolest things I've ever done. Erin is the definition of a working actress in Hollywood, whether it goes back to doing guest appearances on things like Dollhouse, Nip Tuck, Mad Men, Mad Off, or being a primary character in her own shows like Spartacus, Pan Am, uh, Detroit 187, Made in Jersey, even recently appearing as the primary guest star on shows like The Blacklist, having a small role in a movie like The Disaster Artist. Erin has got some incredible stories about whether you just want behind the scenes stories of Hollywood, whether you're an aspiring performer and thinking about moving to Hollywood. She's got great stories to tell between that, her charity work, her own personal struggle with cancer. I'm just glad you guys are here to check this out. So without any further ado, here's my conversation with Aaron Cummings. I've been talking about this all week. I am so incredibly excited to have probably one of the oldest friends I've had since I moved to the United States. I met this girl like shortly after moving to the US. It's actress, but you're so much more than an actress right now. She does so much, including podcasting pretty soon, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. My friend, Erin Cummings. Erin, how you doing? I'm actually getting a little emotional. I didn't realize that you had just moved to America. <laughs> oh yeah, I will, like I was seriously only here for probably two or three months before going to that Comic Con. It was Comic Con, and it was 2008. At. Yep, because we had just finished filming Bitch Slap, and you were doing the movie blog at the time. Yes, and I was doing a Masters of the Web panel, right? And you and a couple of the other Bitch Slap cast and crew came and Me, invaded Julia our panel. Julia Voth and Amrico Olivo, as well as our director, Rick Jacobson, and our producer, Eric Grendeman. And we were dressed so inappropriate for uh, oh, no, you're polite ladies, but very appropriate Comic -Con? for Comic-Con <laughs> and for the Masters of Web panel at like 10 o'clock in the morning. And we strategically stood at the back of the room. I and mean, it was a packed house anyway, but we made sure to stand at the very back of the room in the center so that we had the eyes of all of the panelists and <laughs> made sure that we got an invite to that party, which was oh, great. That's, I forgot That about was our whole point is we wanted to go to the party. And we also wanted to make sure that we, because we knew, well, I say we, our very smart producer and director knew that if we could win the favor of the webmasters, we would immediately get access to, you know, all sorts of online exposure because we had actually been denied Comic-Con I didn't year. know about that. So uh, Bitch Slap was entered. I mean, we're, we're just jumping into Bitch Slap. We'll do that. So Bitch Slap was denied Comic-Con because they said, this is a family-friendly environment, and so we are not what? going to allow this movie Bitch Slap. But they decided, no, Bitch Slap is not a family-friendly film, so we will not show it. Meanwhile, we went to a panel at that exact same Comic-Con and saw a video of women hung from the ceiling by meat hooks and they were naked well, and sure. i'm like yeah of course i mean that's, okay that's so fine. we can hang naked women by the ceiling from the ceiling with meat hooks but showing three badass empowered women fighting for you know fighting each other in the desert with big guns and fast cars and just beating the crap out of each other and kevin sorbo and kevin sorbo <laughs> and lucy lawless as a you know as a bad na naughty nun you know no no, no we can't have not that naughty so. <laughs> so, much so that was why so basically we said you know what we're just gonna go and we're gonna do it ourselves it was actually in addition to finagling our way into the party and um into the hearts of the webmasters we, we would be walking around on the floor and then all of a sudden we'd find a place that looked like it was pretty busy and then one of the producers brian peck would go oh my god is that the bitch slap girls and he'd <laughs> run up with one of our postcards and have a sign and all of a sudden we'd be swarmed so we learned the trick to guerrilla marketing at comic-con is just pretend like you're famous and people will just assume that if you're not right now you will be one day because there's so many new things launching and i really think that it was because of the exposure that we got at Comic-Con, you know, not because, not thanks to Comic-Con, but thanks to people like you and the other webmasters at Comic-Con uh, that really helped you know, launch us. You know, what's funny too is that, um, I, well, that's obviously where I met you and right? Julia. And we'll get into this a little bit. And then both of you were very kind enough to be in that little project that I did myself. That's a very, very wonderful experience <laughs> of the anniversary, which I am looking at your award right behind you. Yeah, yes, so that's, the how, that's where we, we first met. Uh -huh. And... 
your publicist was there and she was the Amy Pham. Amy Pham. Love Amy Pham. And I Who had sadly been... is no longer in the business because she left to be a kindergarten teacher, which shows exactly why she shouldn't be in the business because she has the heart of a kindergarten <laughs> and teacher. And she has a beautiful child now. Yes. And actually, she started, we started following each other, me and Amy, on social media. Uh, around that time. And we have been actively liking and engaging each other stuff ever since. She's since got married. Yeah, to Josh. You, to Josh from, from Chuck. Chuck. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so many good things came out of that. But listen, we're getting ahead of ourselves. I know. Okay. There's so many things to talk about. So much stuff to talk about. And actually, you and I haven't actually been in the same room together for In a very a long while. time. I right. think you came over to my office like two or three years ago and we like when had you gelato just, or something like that. Right. But I also, I don't know if that was before or after. You had a really big bean bag at one point. Oh, were you at my place? I was at your, you were having like an MMA watching something. You came to that? I had yes. no recollection of you coming yes, to that. Yes, I was there. You had this like MMA party and I remember that you had this bean bag that was like yes. this big. And I mean, I don't even remember how you get on the beanbag or where would one would even, I mean, the beanbag would take up this entire room, it seems, like, it, it in my memory. It was enormous. It, it could fit four or five people. Yes. That was by design. I'm not even going to go into all the things I used it for. But I remember when I parted with hey that yo. thing, when Anne and I parted with that, it, it was it was. I'm sure Anne day. came in and was like, that has to go. No, she loved it. Oh, really? She loved it. She thought it was the most comfortable thing in the world. Mm -hmm. But it was, so when it was when it came time to part with it, it was it was bitter, sweet sorrow getting rid. I, oh, I totally forgot about that being bad, Jack. Okay, anyway. Anyway, uh, let me. I, anyway, I'm getting so. This is going to happen throughout this entire interview. Is we're going to start, and then we're going to have to pull and it anyway, back and in. Anyway, we'll get um, there. And you know, before I before I get to it, I by the way, let, let me set this up here. So, Aaron, you are a fabulous example of the working actress mm. in Hollywood. I mean, you have Thank been in, I mean, all you guys got to do, run to Aaron Cummings' IMDb page. You the, you will not believe, like, I know Aaron, and I go through some of the things on there. I'm like, wait a minute, what? She was in Mad Men? Or like, I forget about some of the things that I was in, and <laughs> right? it was just a crazy feeling, yes. And then re and the, the great highlight of this is recently, Anne and I, recently, a few months ago, Anne and I are in the movie theater, <laughs> and we go to see um, the disaster artist, and all of a sudden... Aaron pops up on screen and Anne and I look, Anne's like, did you know Aaron was in this? I had no idea Aaron was in this. And then like a week before that, we're watching Blacklist, which is one of the shows that I watch. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, Anne's like, I run into the kitchen to, to grab something. And Anne's like, "Honey, I think you ought to come in here. I'm like, I'll be right back. She goes, is that Aaron? And was like, there you are on Blacklist. But anyway, you yeah. are a... A, a great example of a working actress in Hollywood. You have yeah. so many incredible stories. So let's just start at the beginning here for a second. Mm -hmm. I am curious, first of all, where are you from and what was it that made you want to get into acting and that whole thing about uprooting and moving to Los Angeles? Whew. Okay. Well, we got a, we got a lot of, we'll, we'll compact this. So I'm an Air Force brat. My dad uh, was an Air Force, is now a retired Air Force intelligence officer. I was born in Lafayette, Louisiana, moved to Omaha, Nebraska, Seoul, Korea, Bossier City, Louisiana, Huntsville, Texas. And then I became a rangerette at Kilgore College, which is a <laughs> tiny little town in East Texas with a very famous dance team. Transferred to the University of North Texas with with every intention of becoming um, an, an account executive in really? New York. Oh yeah, I was going to be, I was going to work on Madison Avenue. I was going to have clients like Pepsi and Budweiser. <laughs> I was going to learn how to play golf. I was going to be doing deals at the strip clubs in Dallas. Like I was just, I, I had it locked down what my plan was. And then I interned for a very big agency and I realized I hate this. And I secretly wanted to be an actress, but I grew up in Huntsville, Texas. Nobody does that. It, it's just crazy. Like I wouldn't even know how to get started doing that. And so, um, I don't even know why I, I did this. I just, I started asking around going, Hey, you know, does anybody know anybody that's an actor? And, and, and somebody said, Oh, well, I have a friend, this woman, Mariana Austin, who was in Dallas, who would teach acting lessons. And so I took my money that I made waiting tables <laughs> at Hooters. <laughs> I didn't, I did not. How did I not know this? And can I tell you, I still have my uniform and it still fits. <laughs> 
I think it still fits. I haven't tried it on in a while. Um, <laughs> but yes, That's I awesome. did. I, I, I did. I, I transferred to the University of North Texas, which was just north of Dallas, was on the dance team. And then I was, uh, you know, working odd jobs in college, as one does. And then I met some really cool girls, and they were talking about how much money they were making. I was like, oh, God, what are they doing to make all this money? And they worked at Hooters. And I used to go there for the wings all the time, and I figured – well, tank top and a pair of shorts, pantyhose. I mean, like, it's probably a lot more than you wear on the college dance team sometimes. Sure. Little crop tops and skirts. So yeah, it was a it was a really fun job. I had I had I had so much fun working there. It it really was um, a very fun experience. But again, totally different interview. So I scraped together my money and I got some really hellacious headshots taken, <laughs> which I will actually have to take a picture of because I I still have them. I knew because because before we did this the other day, I said, hey, we're going to do this interview. If you have any pictures. Like official pictures. Now, I didn't know these ones existed. I've yes. got to see these original headshots. Okay. I will send you headshots. And it actually has my previous name that I went by from sixth grade all through college, which is not Aaron Cummings. It's actually Cookie Cummings. I don't know if you knew that. Yes, I have an entire group of friends that they call me Cookie. Like, they refuse to call me Aaron because it's weird for them. Cookie? My college diploma says Aaron Cookie Lynn Cummings. I'm not even kidding. How do you promote bitch slap <laughs> and not, not talk about that? I, I don't know. Cookie. Because you also have to remember, at that time in my career, I was hanging on to legitimacy as an actress <laughs> by a thread. The last thing I needed on top of a movie called Bitch Slap with no other serious credits to my name. I mean, now I feel like I've earned my place as an actor in Hollywood. You know, I... I I feel totally fine revealing Hooters and Cookie and everything like that because I think it's hysterical. I think at the time I felt like I had a little something to prove. I don't really right. feel like I have anything to prove at this point. So, um, but yes. Uh, gosh, where were we? I'm getting totally off coming, track. Coming to L.A. Coming to L.A. I ended up coming out to Los Angeles just on a fluke, random thing. And I met all these people, you know, our waiters or people that I would randomly be sitting next to on a bench or whatever. And they're all reading these words on pages. And I just started asking them, well, are you an actor? And none of them were related to someone famous. None of them were, uh, you know, the, this idea that I had in my head that you had to be in order to pursue an acting career, which was in some way, uh, you know, connected. Mm. I wasn't connected. I didn't know anybody. And so it sparked something in my mind, like, wow, these people, they go to acting classes, they get headshots, and they just do what I later realized was termed the grind. And I said, well, I can, I can do that. And every person I met, every person I met, I would say, my name is Cookie Cummings, and I'm an actress, and this is what I want to do. And who can you introduce me to? And what advice do you have? And people would, you know, tell me different things about their experiences. I learned a lot of things based on, oh, these people said not to do that, so I'm not going to do that. Right, or, oh, yeah. these are really good acting teachers to go try out, so I'm going to go check them out. And then I had one semester left in college after this you know, Los Angeles trip that just blew my mind open. And I sat my parents down and I said, I know that I'm about to graduate with a degree in advertising and I'm supposed to move to New York and be an account executive and make tons of money and make you really proud. I've decided I'm going to move to Los Angeles and be an actor. And they were like, <laughs> What on earth? Why? Why? And my parents are not creative types. My mom was a nurse. My dad was in the Air Force. Like the, it, it was like I got hatched from an egg or something. Right. They were completely confused. But I said, listen, I have always been someone that has put my all into everything that I do. I don't do it halfway. And this is something that I know if I don't go and try to do this, then I'm always going to regret it. That saying, dreams buried alive never die, I knew that mm. it would be rotting inside of me if I didn't come to Los Angeles and and take the advice that I was given from these random people that I met and, and pursue this passion that I didn't really know I had, but I kind of felt like there was something inside of me. And I also felt like, what have I got to lose? 
You know, I knew that if I stayed in Dallas and I just got a job and or I tried to save up enough money to go. I mean, that's the thing. Everybody goes, well, I'm going to save up enough money and then I'll move to Los Angeles. You'll never have enough money. I mean, it's true. You'll never you'll never have enough money. You just have to do it. And that's what I did. I just said, well, whatever money I have, that's what I'm going to do. And I got a, an apartment in Koreatown, which at the time was a little sketchy. You know, now it's like the hot place to be. But at the time, there was a lot of, you know, violence going on. And I had no air conditioning. And my apartment oh, was... Oh, see, as, as a Canadian, I cannot even... Oh, even with air conditioning, I almost can't handle it here in the Valley. Yeah. I mean, it's... My God. My rent was four seventy five a month. Anywhere in Los Angeles? Are you serious? Yeah, yeah, okay, exactly. You might be I'm sure that it's probably like you know 2,500 now. But and I got a job on Sunset Boulevard, working at a now uh, may it rest in peace Miyagi's. I don't know if you were around. It was like a three story sushi restaurant that turned okay. into a nightclub. Okay. I mean, yeah. the number of girls that I had to try to feed shots to while they were vomiting in the koi pond. It was, <laughs> and my manager would just be like, "I don't care. You got to sell more shots." I'd be like, "Oh." So I did that. I worked as a box model at the Standard. Um, do you know this? Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, for people who don't know, the Standard Hotel has this right behind the check-in desk. There is this big aquarium-looking thing. It's not an actual aquarium. And during the day, they have some sort of art installation. But at night, when they have the DJ, and it's more of a loungy atmosphere, they have a person, male or female, laying in the box. And the rules are you have to wear white pajamas of some sort, and you can't make eye contact and you can't eat. So I would sleep, and then sometimes some drunk person would throw a penny at the glass and it would wake me up. (laughs) Anyway, so I worked that. I was a driver for an adult film actress. It was not Stormy Daniels, sadly, because that would have been a really cool story to tell. Um, I was an assistant to a producer um, whose toilets I had to clean. I um, was an assistant to a Uh, Another guy who was a millionaire and so therefore would get a lot of dates with young women. But unfortunately, my job was to uh, tell creditors lies all day long as they were calling the house because he was so flat broke. Yeah, it was just crazy. I mean, I had these crazy jobs for years i was i was a massage therapist for many years um at a chiropractic office at the standard at the chateau marmont i also have a list of um i was a celebrity massage therapist for a while and i have a i have a list of people that if i ever write a tell-all book (laughs) so that was like so so that's you have your own molly's game you're gonna be putting out here sometime pretty much okay (laughs) so Um, yeah, I just, I kind of just said, let's just do it. What's, why not? And I moved out here and I just worked every odd job I could to pay for my acting classes. And that was the big thing. My priority was I'm in class every single week. And this was when we could do, um, casting director auditions. And now they're like really regulated and I don't know what's going on with them, but I went to every casting director um, uh, you, where you pay like $39 and you get to read a scene for this casting director or that casting director and they tell you what their office is like. And, you know, yeah, are you paying for an audition? Sure, but I didn't have an agent. No agency would sign me. No one would touch me. I find that a lot of my friends, and I've had many friends who've come to LA to sure. try to, and like one of the big things that all of them have said to me at different points was that one of the things that we didn't realize moving to LA is that you just think you're going to come to LA and just sign an agent, but no. it's so difficult to get an agent. Yes. Well, I have to say there, another thing that's hard is, you know, just getting your SAG card. And I, here's the story about how I got my SAG card. And this is kind of... Especially, which for people watching is the Screen Actors Guild. The Screen Actors Guild, which, you know, you're not... It's, it's almost impossible to get an agent if you don't have your SAG card. Because if you don't have your SAG card, no one can hire you. Because if they hire you and you're not a member of the union, then A, they have to pay some fee to make you a member of the union. And then they have to write a letter about why they hired a non-union actor instead of a union actor already. So it's kind of a big deal. And especially, I mean, if you're maybe a six foot four albino who speaks Mandarin Chinese, then yeah, there's not a lot of people in your category that they could hire instead of you. But if you're a 23 year old, you know, young girl 
who doesn't who didn't graduate from Juilliard, then yeah, you're pretty replaceable. You're interchangeable with a lot of other people. So it was going to be very difficult for me. Um, on that trip to Los Angeles, one of the people that I met was an extras casting director. He worked for Central Casting. And he said, if you ever make it out to Los Angeles, give me a call and I'll help you get your SAG card. Great. So I came out to Los Angeles and I called him and I said, hey, I'm here. You said you'd help me, so I need some help. So he said, okay, great. You know, come by Central. We'll put you through the works. And I filled out the little card and I got my photos taken and blah, blah, blah. And he came out and said, hi. So he said, I have a job for you tomorrow. And I was an extra on um, the Power Rangers. And yeah, it was like one of the Power Rangers. Really? Oh, yeah. You were an extra in Power Rangers. I was an extra in Power Rangers. Please tell me you were one of the putties or, or whatever the villains were. No, no. <laughs> I, I was like just a person walking around. Like okay. I wasn't, it wasn't anything exciting. Um, and so that was like my first day as, as an extra, but I got to be a SAG extra. So for those of you at home who don't know, just doing extra work does not mean that you would get your SAG card. You could do extra work, but if you got a green voucher, that was, you were being non-union extra for the day. If you got a pink voucher, that was, that was a big deal. That meant that you were being hired as a union extra for right. the day. And you needed three pink vouchers in order to become SAG eligible. So I got my first pink voucher that day because my, this, my friend. And then I, he got me another job working on like some little movie or something. And I was, I got my second voucher. And so I called him and I said, thank you so much. So generous. I'm so excited. Um, do you have any work for me tomorrow? And he goes, yeah, yeah, I'm sure I've got something. Why don't you come by the office? I'd love to introduce you to some people. Great. So I go to the central casting office. He introduces me to all these different people. And one person said, you know, ha happened to hand me, you know, his, his card. Great. So then my friend says, um, oh, I'm serving and it's, the office is closing down. Do you want to go over to CPK, California Pizza Kitchen, and just, you know, grab a pizza? I'm like, well, sure, of course. We're going to CPK. We're not going to, like, you know, Mastro's. We're not going to some fancy romantic dinner. Yeah. So we get I've, there. I've heard you tell this story before. Yeah, we get there and he starts drinking some, you know, like white Zinfandel, which should have been my first clue. <laughs> Never dine with anyone that drinks white Zinfandel and thinks they're classy for it. Um, so he's getting a little tipsy and then he starts asking me questions like, oh, wow, I bet you're pretty wild. And blah, blah, blah. So here I am, like I've given this person no reason to think that there's anything romantic. I didn't say, hey, you know, I really could get, I'd really love to get my SAG card and I'm willing to do anything. Uh, no, no, no. He said, hey. If you ever come back to LA, I'll help you get your SAG card. Give me a call. Great. All right. So I did. And like I said, he got me my first two pink vouchers. Right, right, right. I just needed one more. And so he said, so how bad do you want that third voucher? Oh, my God. I'm not kidding. Like, and I said, well, I mean, I, I need to get the third voucher to become SAG eligible. But I no, I mean, what do you mean? And he said, oh, come on, Aaron. Like, this is just the way things work in this business. And I had just gotten here. I didn't know. And I'm like, is this really the way things work in this business? I'm just thinking, oh, okay. I, 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 I mean, it was just not on the table. And he just kept pushing and kept pushing. And I'm in my mind going, okay, well, I'm not going to sleep with this guy. And also, if I'm going to fuck my way to the top... That's one thing, but I'm not trying to fuck my way to the middle. All right. right. It's an extras casting. Or the lower director. middle. <laughs> right. Exactly. Like there, you know, come on. And so, um, I don't know how the conversation ended, but I was very upset and I just got up and I walked out. And just as I walked out, I remembered that other guy that gave me his card. And I really quickly, before he, the guy in the restaurant had a chance to call him, I don't know if he saw that I'd gotten that card, I pulled the card out and I go, hey, 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 I met you earlier. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, you know, I, I just, I have two SAG vouchers and I just need one more. Do you have any work for me tomorrow? And he goes, oh yeah, something actually just came in. Can you be on set at 6.30 in the morning? Sex in the City is shooting out here and they need someone. Yep, I'm there. And the next day at 6.30 in the morning, I was on set for Sex in the City. But... I just think about that, like, you know, that was, that happened 
before I even, I don't even know if I was fully moved out here yet. I remember I, I, I was a reader for a friend of mine who was a casting director years later. And um, he was in, he's a New York based casting director, but he was in Los Angeles and I was the reader. And at the end of the day, they were holding auditions in one of the conference rooms at the W Hotel in, uh, in Westwood. And at the end of the day, the director sat me down and full on propositioned me and said, listen, you know, we've seen all these actresses, but I've been hearing you read and you're quite good. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'd love to come in and read for the role myself. Well, you don't even need to. I've, I've been hearing you read all day. But you know, like we're going to be in whatever country filming. And basically, and he did not basically, he said, if you would sleep with me, I'll give you this role. And I said, I have a boyfriend. I'm not interested in that. And he said, well, your boyfriend can. Well, and I remember calling the casting director and telling him about this and thinking that he might be like, oh my gosh. And he said, well, yeah. Yeah. And apparently the girl who did sleep with him, she got the job. And I actually was going through, I was looking for, I was cleaning out my, um, my computer and going through files. And I found this old interview that I did for Backstage, the trade yeah. magazine for actors. And I found this interview that I did years ago. And there's a whole paragraph in which I'm talking about this sexual harassment hmm. scenario and I'm like, wow, I'm full on saying this in an interview that got published. Not one person called me to say, wow, that is really shocking. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I can't believe you had to deal with that. Oh my, no one, like not my agent, not my manager, not my friends, not anyone in the industry, not the casting, no one, because it was so understood that that's just the level of garbage that you had to deal with. And so it's really fascinating now that the Me Too movement is happening and people are acting so shocked. And I'm like, we've been dealing with this forever. There's not an actress that I know that hasn't been dealing with this. And I'm so thankful that it is getting the attention that is necessary. I mean, I was on Astronaut Wives Club and I had a director give me a little, just a little swat on the bottom. And I turned around and I swat him back and I said, don't you touch my ass. That is not yours. <laughs> and he was like, what's wrong? And, nah, nah, nah. and and then I went over to the table and I said, fucking guy, just touch my ass. And he was like, oh, he's such a pig. But that's the level of, oh, so gross. But like, there was no outrage. And I'm glad that now, if something like that were to happen, I feel like we, as women, would be more empowered to go to a, uh, to go to a producer or to go to someone and say, hey, the director just gave me a swat on my butt and I am here as a working professional. I'm not here as his little plaything, And I'm also one of the stars of this show. But even if I was a background actor, that wouldn't be okay. And so, and I feel confident now that someone would pull him aside and say something to him, right. you know? I certainly wouldn't have felt confident about that a year ago. I have to play the game a little bit. Mm. So how am I going to play the game? Am I going to sleep with these people to get, you know, one little job? No, I'm not going to do that. But what is it that sets me apart from all of these actresses that are taken seriously that, you know, that, that people see something in them more? They have something on their resume that says it. Well, no one's hiring me right now and I can't get an agent. But what I can get is I can get a name. And I was accepted into the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art. But I went to London and I studied Shakespeare and I developed my craft even more. And I came back with something that I didn't have before. Right. It was a little line on my resume, but it was something stronger than that. It was when I walked in the room, I knew I was as good as those other girls. I knew that they might have gone to Juilliard and they might have gone to Yale and they might have been, you know, daughter of so and so or niece of so and so, but I am a Shakespearean trained actress. Right. And there was something about the weight that I carried into a room after I had that knowledge. I didn't feel like well, you know, I got nothing on my resume and uh, I got an advertising degree and nobody cares about. I'm a Shakespearean fucking trained actress. <laughs> You're going to take me seriously. And that was, I think, something that walked into the room before I did. 
and people stopped saying that as much. You know, there's mm. always, no matter where you are, there's always going to be a certain level of, you know, people trying to be weasels. There's weasels on every level, male and female. But there was something that it did in me that couldn't be taken away from by anyone. And I think that's something that's really important is you may not be able to get an agent. You may not be able to, you know, get a big, impressive credit on your resume, but you can do something. You can learn a skill that no one else has. You can get some training that, you know, very few other people have. You can get something that gives you that confidence that walks in the room before you do that, bas that basically says, don't try to fuck me. I'm here for a job, not for your dick. Right. That's a bumper sticker. A <laughs> that is a, that's a good t-shirt right there, actually. <laughs> I'm here for a job, not for your dick, says Aaron Cummings. Says Aaron Cummings. Let me ask you about this. Yes. You, you, so you've come here now. You've gone through the gauntlet. Yes. You get your vouchers. You, uh -huh. you get SAG. One of the first recognizable shows that you book is that you actually had speaking lines on and everything mm -hmm. was a Star Trek show, Star Trek Enterprise. Walk me through, like, just briefly, walk me through how did that come about okay. and how did that change things? Because it's not just a show, it's a Star Trek show. Yeah. How'd that come about? So it's actually a funny story and he might kill me for saying this. <laughs> so remember I was saying that I was a massage therapist at the Chateau yes. Marmont? Brandon Braga really was staying at the Chateau Marmont. Okay. I happened to be working the night that he had called for massage. I became his massage therapist and Brandon is so lovely. We invited him to my wedding. My dad actually talked about Brandon in his father, the bride speech because <laughs> Brandon gave me my first job in television. And so I was Brandon's massage therapist for, for a long time. And when I got back, he and I got back from London. He knew that I had gone to London to study. And when I got back, I did my first play that, um, you know, my first equity play. And so he knew that I was working really, really hard. And he said to me one time, you know, the theater stuff that you're doing is great, but you got to get some television credits. And I said, well, I don't have an agent. How am I supposed to get an audition? And he said, here's the deal. I don't really deal with casting. And he was executive producer and creator of Star Trek Enterprise, of course. He said, I don't have anything to do with casting, but I promise you, if we ever have a script that has a small role, you know, I'm not going to be able to make you a series regular. He goes, but if we have a small role, just something to, you know, get you started. I'll have you brought in. And if the casting directors and the director cast you, great. But, you know, you got to audition for it. I said, great. That's fine. I get the call. Hi. Um, yeah, we're calling from someone. Okay, great. So I go in and I audition. Get the call. Ah, I'm going to tell you for my first time. I'm going to tell you for my Call my parents. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to go search for my This is so exciting. They're going to pay me $900 for one day of work. I've never made that much money in my life. Oh, my God. And my mom was like, oh, my God, that's amazing. What's your role? And I said, I'm prostitute number one. <laughs> Which is great because when you look up your IMDb, oh, yeah. it says prostitute number one. And there is silence <laughs> on the phone. My very Catholic mother, <laughs> my very conservative military father, they pause. And then my dad goes with this beautiful Texan accent. Well, that Julia Roberts played a prostitute and she's done just <laughs> fine. And I was like, yes. So that was my first role. I walk up to the car and I go, you looking for a date, honey? And he goes, uh, maybe with your friend. And I go, you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> Apparently they needed like bl Klingon blood and I didn't have Klingon blood. It was a whole thing. The Carpenter Street episode, if anybody wants. It was the very, very beginning of the episode as the uh, opening guest star credits are rolling. <laughs> I was just so happy. I never wanted to go. When they said, okay, you're wrapped. It was like someone stabbed me in the heart. I just didn't <laughs> want to leave. And I think that's when you know that you're doing the right thing is when, right. you know, even if you're just standing around doing nothing, the thought of not standing around doing nothing in that place is is hard. So yeah, that was that was my first one. 
Okay, now let's fast forward a little bit because shortly after that, a bunch of things come up. Dante's Cove. Ah, uh, Dante's um, Cove. But even things like uh, like Charmed, mm -hmm. uh, Dollhouse. Like, yeah, uh, Charmed just was Wings. what got me my first legitimate agent. Because really? I, yes, so um, Kim Foster McCollum, who I recently saw at a, at a Christmas party of ours, she is married to uh, Chuck McCollum, who's also a casting director. I did a casting director workshop with Kimberly. And I don't know if it's okay that I share this story, but I'm going to anyway. <laughs> A lot of times people will not tell you the real when you're an actor. Like you just, well, you'll literally go for years without work and no one will say, listen, you really got to stop wearing those jeans because you got camel toe, honey. Like no one will tell you what's so, you have a unibrow, just fucking shave it and we'll hire you. Like right. there's something that is, is sometimes people don't want to tell you the truth. And I remember after I met Kimberly, she, she pulled me aside at the end and she was working for the then CW. And she said, what feedback do you get in auditions? And I said, I don't really get auditions. I don't have an agent. And she said, I'm going to tell you something that I think you need to know because no one's telling you. She said, you are so talented and you have a great look and I would love to bring you in. But the CW won't let, will not hire you because you have a skin problem. And now I knew that I had acne, but really? when you... Sometimes you get delusional about whether or not other people can notice it. It's kind of like, I don't know, when you own a pet and you smell your pet every day, whether it's a litter box or it's wet dog, and you get so used to it that you forget. And then you go out of town and you walk in and you're like, whoa, my God, this place smells like a dog. <laughs> we got to get a vacuum in here. It's kind of like that. And I knew that I had acne, but I didn't realize that it was the thing that was preventing me from getting jobs. The very next day, I went to a dermatologist and I said, and I cried to this dermatologist. I was like, you got it. I don't know what you got to do, but you got to fix this. I went on Accutane, skin cleared up, cut to maybe nine months later, I was interning for a casting office and Chuck McCollum was the associate. Wow. And I didn't know that Kim and Chuck even knew each other. I never, I never saw Kim again. At, at, at this point in the story. So I'm in, I'm, 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 you know, interning and I'm like doing this for free, which by the way, I also think is a great idea for actors. If you have any connection to any casting office, say, I will intern for you. I don't even know if you can now because of labor laws and stuff. Yeah, it's, be that, it's become very, very tricky. Uh, I, Cause I used to have so many people oh, yeah. writing to me every day. Can I come intern for you? And it's like, I don't think we are even allowed. And that's the thing. I learned so much by interning. It was such a valuable experience because I got to you know, see the casting process from the other side. And I realized that so little of it has to do with the actors sometimes. But anyway, so I, I'm, I meet Chuck McCollum and he's just lovely. Well, he comes in one day and he said, have you ever met a woman named Kim Foster? And I said, well, yeah, I, I did. In fact, like, you know, she's actually pretty amazing and she really helped me a lot of ways. And he said, she's my fiance. And I happened to mention that we had this lovely actress who was interning for us. And she said, how's her skin? Was, what do you mean? Her skin is perfect. That's what are you great. talking about? Immediately after that, I got a call for Charmed. And she called me in. She looked at me. She gave me this big smile. And I got the job. And that was my first guest starring role. And I actually, I was also, I was doing a play for no money. Maybe I was paid $15 a performance. And for this megalomaniac director, it was like on Santa Monica Boulevard. It was just this crazy experience. And the guy that I was in the play with, his mom knew an agent, wanted the agent to come see her son. He sent his assistant. And at the end of the night, she came up to me and she said, do you have an agent? And I said, no, I don't. But here's a postcard. So I always had postcards. You know, my name and nah, nah, nah. next day I get this call. Oh, my assistant saw you in a play last night and said you were lovely. I'd love you to come in and let's take a meeting. So we took the meeting. And then as I was walking out of the meeting, Kim called and said, you booked the role of charm, uh, this role on charm. So then I run, ran back into the office and I said, oh, hey, I got great news. I just booked a role on charmed. And he goes, I'll take it from here. You're signed. And that was it. Like he signed me, boom. Like you already got a job. Great. I'll take 10% of that. Thank you. And so that's how I got my first agent. 
Yes. That's amazing. So, so that's the thing. I got my first agent because I had done the casting director workshop. I had taken the advice of a casting director instead of going, oh my gosh, she thinks I have pimples and I'm so beautiful and why does she... No, no, no. I just went, oh, okay. You can't hire me because I have acne? I'm going to get rid of the acne then. I'm not going to waste time going, why do they think I'm fat? Why don't they think I'm pretty enough? Oh, okay. You think I should lose a few pounds? Well, fuck you. I disagree. Or you know what? I can actually stand to lose a few. I'm going to do that. Like you got to figure it out for yourself. If I decided that my sense of self was totally fine having acne and that was the way that I presented myself to the world and they just had to, you know, deal with it, then you make that decision and you move forward. And I say this as like, whatever your body type is, there's every body type in television and movies. No one's going to say, well, you have to be super skinny to be an actress. I'm not super skinny, but I love my body. And you know what? My body type has worked really well for me. And so I want to be the best version of me. So if the best version of you is five or 10 pounds lighter, maybe lose five or 10 pounds. Maybe the best version of you is five or 10 pounds heavier. You gotta figure that out. But if someone gives you some feedback, you then have to go, okay, is this person speaking in my best interest as Kimberly was when she said the WB, oh, it was the WB. Yeah, the WB. The WB, the now w the CW. Now the CW. The WB won't let me hire you because of your acne. I knew that she was saying, I believe in you. I want to hire you, but this is the thing that's standing in the way. And I said, okay, I'm going to go fix it. So I did the casting director workshop. I went and fixed my acne. I was interning in the casting office. I was doing this play for no money. I, you know, I went to the, like all of these things happen just for me to get my first agent. I heard very early on that the number one, that the common denominator amongst successful people, truly successful people who have longevity is a determination and a tenacity. And for me, I didn't give myself a time frame. I think that is, people say, well, how long are you going to give it? And I go, that's crazy. I mean, nobody asked me that now, but in the beginning people would say, well, how long are you going to give it? How long are you going to, you know, what happens if you don't make it in two years? What, am I going to move back to Texas? For what? No, I said, I live in Los Angeles. Los Angeles is my home. And when my friends would call me from Texas and go, when are you moving home? I'd say, I am home. Hmm. My home is Los Angeles. And I am an actress. That is what I do. That is who I am. And sometimes I'm riding high as an actress. And sometimes I'm scraping the bottom. But no matter where I am, I am an actress. And when you say that and you believe it, it doesn't matter, you know, what's going on at that moment. It doesn't matter where your income is. It's the commitment that you have to yourself, to your craft, and honestly, to the people that you serve as an actor.